Okay, well, welcome everyone to the Not So Secure webinar. Um, it's about time, so we'll we'll kick things off. We have got a few talks to go through today. Let's just give you a bit of a, um, a brief intro into what we're expecting. So, like I say, we have three talks, and we've got about 60 minutes scheduled for this. Um, each talk is, is about 15 to 20 minutes, and we hopefully have a little bit of time after each for some questions. Um, as it stands, you have um, access to the um, webinar question pane, so you can type your questions in there. Um, Will, Anant, and myself are monitoring this, so we'll be able to um, respond as and, as and when we can. Um, like I say, the, the is a quite uh, a tighter is quite a tight um, schedule we've got here. So we'll try and address questions um, immediately after each talk. So we have the IPv6 talk first. Um, so if you do have any questions, please feel free to, to write them in as you think about them, and then I can um, answer these a little bit before we get to the next uh, talk from Anand by Docker. Um, at the end, we will hopefully have a little bit of time to address any questions that are left over, and um, I'm sure we can sort of reach into a bit of extra time if any of you guys or girls have uh, anything else you want to ask. So, um, like I say, there's myself, Owen, Owen Shearing, um, Anant, we have, um, I'll, I'll let the, the guys do their own introductions, but we have um, talking about Docker, and that's the second talk of the day, and then we have uh, Will, who will be talking, there's a couple of talks, in fact, um, regarding password uh, cracking. Now, we have to have the obligatory, this is us, okay, so this is, the not, this is not so secure, this is what we do. Now, we are a pen test and training company, okay? Um, we actually did a bit of, uh, quite a lot of training at Black Hat USA uh, this year. The photograph you see there is actually, the, it's a NAND teaching the AIH class, the Advanced Infrastructure Hacking class. It was the biggest class this year of about 150 people. Um, now, what we do is, during our pen test, if we find something, you know, a bit funky, a bit different, in web apps, infrastructure, mobile apps, whatever it, it may be. We try and sort of get that uh, replicated in our labs and develop it for a training course, and hence the training courses are bang up to date. There's some new and funky stuff in there, so if you're interested, there's some um, details at the bottom. Now, with that said, um, we're going to get into the first talk. We've got IPv6 for pen testers, which, like I say, is, is myself taking this. Um, I will, um, there's a lot of content to go through in a little period of time, so um, we will be releasing these slides from each of the talks afterwards, and hopefully as well a recording of this webinar. Okay, so a little bit about myself, I'm not going to say too much. If you want to contact me, it's Reboot user virtually everywhere, so Twitter, GitHub, and so on. Um, now this talk, we're going to be looking at IPv6 in regards to pen testing and some configuration weaknesses. Um, this is rather than any sort of weaknesses with the protocol per se, okay? So this is stuff that we, we come across and um, a way of looking at a host in a different light, really. So we need to look at a bit of theory. It is minimal. It's, it's, it's not going to be too boring. Just so we get an idea of what IPv6 addresses are going to be useful to us. Um, we're going to then see how we connect to remote systems or via IPv6. Um, we're going to see how we can use a, a non-IPv6 uh, toolset um, to actually connect to IPv6 services. And then finally, we're going to actually put this into practice, i.e. this is the stuff we see in, you know, in pen tests in daily life. And these are the, the, the sort of common pitfalls. So let's just get on here. This is the um, light touch on addressing. Like I say, this minimal theory. So we've got these FE80 addresses, these link local unicast addresses. Now, if you've got an IPv6 enabled interface, um, it will have a um, FE80 address, okay? And this can be thought of as equivalent to the 169.254 auto addressing scheme in IPv4, and it's not routable, okay? That's a, a key here. We've then got these unique uh, local unicast addresses, the ULAs. We don't really, or well, I don't touch on in this in this talk too much, but these are comparable to your private IPv4 addresses, so your 10 dot whatever, 172, 16, and, and so on. The one, or the address scheme, or the addressing scheme we're going to be looking at a lot are the global unicast addresses. So these are routable and they're comparable to your public IPv4 addresses. We'll see a lot more of those in the next few slides. We've also got these two um, addresses here, these multicast addresses, so the double F02 double colon 1, um, and we have double colon 2. So double colon 1 denotes all nodes, double colon 2 all routers. Um, so this is basically saying if anything's addressed this multicast address uh, for all nodes, then it goes to all nodes, okay, quite simply. And we can use that in identifying hosts, okay, so which hosts are available to us. 
So we've got the first line here, we're using ping six. Um, it's just a very rudimental scan to essentially ping the FF02 double color one multicast group. And like I say, this is all nodes. So any node on, on your local network um, is part of this group um, and it will respond, okay? Now that will get um, link local addresses, these FE80 addresses back. Now if we want to see if there are any global addresses um, on our network, then we can essentially use the same principle but instead of using E0 as the, the source, we say the source is our global address, okay? So we have to have a node with a IPv6 global address. We use the global address as our source, and then we ping the um, FF02 double colon one uh, multicast group, and the responses will be the live hosts with global addresses on our network. Now, that's great, because ping six is quite readily available to us, but if we do have access to, say, um, a Kali machine or an attacking machine, we can use the THC, the Hacker's Choice IPv6 toolset, which um, essentially does this and a, a lot more, okay? Um, it's worth mentioning on Kali, we've got the um, THC toolset, but it's renamed ATK6, just to just confuse. Um, but here we're using ATK6, a live six, which is essentially finding live um, IPv6 hosts. Now this is a, a dirty one-liner, it can most likely be cleaned up in many a different way, but it works, okay? So what we're doing here is we're essentially trying to discover the hosts on the network and we're, we want to know their IPv4 address, their IPv6 global address and their IPv6 link local address, okay? So that's assuming they've got a global address. So in this case, we've got the 192.168.1.07. You can see below that we've got the global address and then we have the link local address. Now, why do we want to do this? Well, this is going to be something we address in this talk, um, but essentially we may have different services running over the different protocols and so on. So it's something we have to essentially look at all, all of the uh, all round picture to make sure we cover off everything. Now, it was interesting, when I was doing this testing um, a few months ago now, a month or two ago, um, I noticed that I, in a default installation, um, a standard ping, uh, an ICMPv6 echo request, um, you'll get a valid response from Unix-based system or Unix-based host, but Windows didn't like this, they didn't reply, okay? so. Um, we didn't really cover off all bases there. Now, in SCAPI, this is just a, a very simple packet, okay? It's just denoting this, this sort of response, and we've got the Wireshark output there. So what we could do is essentially craft an invalid packet using SCAPI. So in this case, we're using or injecting a, a new header, um, and we're essentially giving it a valid packet, but we do get a response from Windows systems, but only Windows systems. Unix-based systems didn't reply to this. Now that's great from a host discovery point of view, because we get a response. We know the host is live, um, and we also know that the, the, the IPv6 address is disclosed, um, and, and whatever. So from our point of view, that's all we need. Um, it's worth mentioning that the uh, THC or ATK6 or Live6 uh, tool does actually implement these sort of checks and it actually um, is, is very thorough in the way it discovers hosts, so it can be fairly reliable. Okay, so one thing to mention in regards to Windows. Now, if, you are, if you're on a Windows system and you're trying to connect to a UNC, UNC path, um, you usually have a double slash and then you might put in an IP address, so 192.168, whatever it is. Now, in IPv6, you've obviously got these colons separating the address. Now, these colons um, are not um, valid in a UNC path. So Microsoft's way of solving this issue is we switch out the colons for hyphens, okay? So we have, instead of FE80 double colon A00, we have FE80 um, double hyphen A00. So that seems sensible. But additionally, we have to apply this dot .ipv6 hyphen literal .net to the end of the um, IPv6 address there. Um, and that works, and then we can browse our S&P shares and you know, things work as, as normal. Now, it does seem a bit weird, and I'm not implementing or uh, insinuating anything here, um, but the IPv6 literal.net domain um, is actually up for auction. Now, this was taken uh, 91 days ago or so, 80 days ago, um, and I believe it's just come to an end, but it would be interesting to see if any traffic does go to this. I'm not saying it does or not, but it's one of those um, domains that could be of interest if you're, if you're looking. So getting back to the topic in hand. Right, um, we have this FE80 address, we have this link local address, okay? Now, we are on our own network, you know, a, a local LAN, home, office, wherever it may be, and we're trying to connect to an IPv6 global address um, from our, our, our um, LAN. Now, if you remember, these FE80 addresses aren't routable, so we, don't, we, we can't connect, we don't have any connectivity out. This is where a tunnel broker or something similar can come in useful. 
So a tunnel broker um, essentially allows us to use an IPv4 network, so the internet, and we can communicate with an IPv6 host, that is our broker, for one of a better phrase, a proxy, and this can then talk to the IPv6 service that we wish to communicate with. Um, it is worth mentioning that obviously you are passing traffic over an unknown entity at this point, so just, just be wary of that. Um, but if you don't have a global IPv6 address, this is a nice way of getting connectivity. Now in my case, I'm quite lucky with the ISP in the UK we've got here, um, um, we supply global addresses throughout, so it's not something we have to actually concern ourselves with because we do get that connectivity out of the box. So when we've got connectivity to the um, public IPv6 space, we can essentially do our normal recon techniques. Now, I'm not, these are very basic checks here. I'm not going to go into two months just because of the time issues. Um, but as you can see, we're just pinging um, ipv6.rebootuser.com. So this ipv6.rebootuser.com is going to be our target from now on. And you can see the normal IPv4 ping. Um, we get the IPv4 address resolved, but we don't get any ICMP responses. Now, if we ping six, the same host, so in this case, we're targeting the same host, but the IPv6 interface, um, we're actually getting a response, and obviously we get the, the IP address resolved. So straight away, you can see there's a difference there because we're getting responses from IPv6, but not four. Okay, so that's something we will investigate. Um, and similarly, we've just got NS look up at the bottom there just to sort of um, highlight how you can obviously re resolve the names in, in many of the same techniques we use for IPv4. Okay, like I say, it's just a very light touching at the moment. So here we go into a bit more, okay. We've got, uh, on the left, we are targeting this ipv6.rebootuser.com um, with their map, uh, default scan, so it's just a 1,000 ports, and this is the IPv4 interface of that host. On the right-hand side, we've got the same scan, but this is targeting the IPv6 interface of that host. So you can see on the IPv4, we've got 999 filtered ports, the host is behind a firewall, um, and we also have only port 80 open. Okay, so straight away we've just got one port to target and, and that seems pretty restrictive. The right hand side, we've got the same host, but we've got 998 closed ports, um, so it's not behind a firewall, or if it is, it's an incorrectly configured firewall, and we've got two ports exposed. Not only do we have port 80, but we've also got the second port of SSH. So via the um, IPv6 interface, we've identified that it's not behind a firewall and we have a second interface to potentially target. To take this um, to the next sort of level, We've got a bit of a white box uh, view here, okay? So the first here, the, the top um, configuration, is actually showing if you hit the IPv6 um, interface of this host, um, this is an Nginx configuration, okay? So if you pit, uh, hit the IPv6 interface on port 80, you get served content from var www html ipv6. And you can see at the moment, that's just an index PHP page saying you hit my IPv6 page, this is your IP. Similarly, on the IPv4 page, if you um, communicate with the host on the IPv4 address, um, then you'll serve content from var www html ipv4. And functionality is very similar, but you get shown, this is my IPv4 page and this is your IPv4 address. Okay, so we'll take that to one more level. Um, in the IPv6 um, directory, in the IPv6 www root, we have this Word, uh, or WP, WordPress um, installation, okay? So if we navigate to the IPv6 um, address and then slash WP, we get served WordPress content and there's a, a potential uh, avenue for attack there. Now on the same host, if we're just looking at IPv4, um, WordPress or WP doesn't exist, okay, because it's served from a different directory. Um, there's nothing else for us to, to check there. There's nothing else for us to attack. So if we were just looking at a host on an IPv4 address, um, then there's a, another avenue that we would completely miss, and it's a potential um, sort of a attack vector that, that we could leverage. So we've identified there's a WordPress installation on IPv6. So what do we do? Well, we use our, our normal tools as such to, to sort of um, enumerate, see what's, see what's there. So in this case, we've got WP scan. We feed it the URL in IPv6 form, and WP scan is IPv6 aware. So it works quite nicely. Um, nothing untoward there. If we try and use an IPv6 unaware tool, so something like Nikto, we feed that the IPv6 address, and then we get this weird and wonderful error, cannot resolve host name, understandably, because it's not an IPv4 address, um, and things fail. So we can make this work, and this is where a tool like SOCAT can come in. So what we do is say, SOCAT, you listen on my local box, on my attacking box, um, anything you hear on TCP4, so IPv4 port 80, you forward to this IPv6 address. Now this is the IPv6 address of ipv6.rebootuser.com um, on port 80, so it would be directed to that correct host. Now Nikto, if you scan my local host, 
um, any traffic will be fed to SOCAT, SOCAT knows where this is going and it forwards it to the target for reboot user and it will work seamlessly. Okay, that's, that's one nice thing we can do on Linux. When it comes to Windows, we can do much the same. So if we happen to be using Windows as an attacking platform, um, I'm picking on Zap here just because it's got a nice issue. Uh, to be honest, I, I don't I don't use that for my daily work. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not um, targeting this tool specifically. There are many tools that uh, fail to talk to IPv6, but in this case, you can see you give it a specific URL. Um, it tells you failed to attack the URL reference, and it's got an IPv6 reference, so we can assume that it's not IPv6 aware. So what we can do is use NetSH and this port proxy interface. So we essentially, it's the same principle as SOCAT to be honest. We set up our port proxy interface and say, okay, you listen on the localhost, anything on port 80, you again forward to this um, IPv6 address, exactly the same principle, just a bit of a different command. And then in Zap, we say, okay, Zap, you scan yourself, 127.0.0.1, you happily go, uh, go out that because it's an IPv4 address. And then the NetSH port proxy interface uh, forwards this traffic to the right destination. So there's a couple of ways using um, Unix and Windows host to get around these um, limitations. So let's go into our real world um, um, example here. So again, this is the IP tables configuration of IPv6 um, at rebootuser.com. Um, anything that's not defined here, ingress or regress, will be logged and dropped. So this is the complete um, list, okay? So uh, the, the stuff in green, this is our connection coming in. So remember, we've got Nginx running there. So if we try and navigate to this um, Nginx um, interface, then we're allowed through. The next line down, the burgundy line to DNS or Google's DNS server is just so we can resolve some DNS on the host, a quick and easy um, sort of hack. And then we've got these um, purple lines. Now, it needs a bit of a backstory because we don't generally need this sort of um, connections out. But if you've got a WordPress installation, um, if you've done any WordPress admin, you've got this option to add plugins, etc. Um, and these are the default WordPress sites or some of the default WordPress um, um, uh, IP addresses, should I say, that are tr that, that, that the the application tries to connect to. So we have to allow about outbound connections because obviously we've limited both ingress and egress. So uh, we have to define those here. So if it doesn't match any of this, then it's um, dropped and logged. Okay. So here we go. Here's an example. On the left-hand side, we've got our victim, and on the right-hand side, we have our attacker. Now, just to give you a bit of context to this, we've got um, the attacker is targeting WordPress. Um, we're targeting WordPress. We've had um, a, a breach of some sort, okay? So maybe for a phishing attack, the WordPress admin credentials have been um, leaked. Um, it doesn't really matter. It's sort of irrelevant to this ta uh, attack. We're interested in the sort of network connectivity. But somehow, the attacker has gained access to WordPress credentials. So we've got the WordPress credentials, and then we're using a, um, a auxiliary, sorry, an exploit module within Metasploit, um, this WP admin shell upload, which basically allows us to, to write a PHP, some PHP code, and get a shell, shell access back. Um, again, it's relevant to this attack, because we're really interested in the sort of underlying network connectivity and what's going on um, with IP. Okay, so you can see from the attacker's system, we've authenticated with WordPress, the green plus, um, and we're trying to upload this payload. Now, the payload is this Meterpity shell, and it's connecting back to the attacker's machine. So the attacker's IPv4 address is 46.101.19.46, and we're trying to connect back on port 9999. Okay, so it's a weird and wonderful port, but we've seen the IP tables rules, and they're pretty restrictive. Um, and we can see that the authentication um, succeeds, but the, the payload fails. We don't get a connection back. Now, if we look at the victim on the left-hand side, we're just catching out the, the logs here. And you can see that the rule has been dropped. Um, so you can see this destination of 46.101.19.46 on 9.9.9.9. There are multiple instances of the connection being dropped. So IP tables are kicking in and doing their stuff and saying, yeah, OK, we're, we're not allowing that out. All right. So us as an attacker, we know the IPv6 um, address. So what about if we set our L host? We don't use IPv4, but we use the IPv6 address of our attacking host. Again, we use the same port, 9999. Now, this time, you'll notice a shell does load. It does pop. And on the left-hand side, you can see our IP, IP6 tables rules are in their default state. Um, and they're not automatically caught, so IP tables only tackles IPv4 uh, traffic. Now, this is a common uh, mistake because IPv6 is enabled on many hosts by default these days, most hosts by default. Um, but if, our, if we're using IP tables to admin these Unix hosts, then IP6 tables is often forgotten about and it's left wide open. Um, so in this case, yep, it's in this default state and we can get a connection back and we, we have a shell as an attacker. 
So what can we do? Um, well, we can essentially utilize IP6 tables. Uh, so it's something we, we need to sort of implement as well. And this is a quick and easy rule. Um, we'll need some tightening up in general, but it just gives you an idea. It's very similar uh, functionality to IP tables. It's just we have to remember to configure them. Um, similarly, there are some utilities out there. So for example, um, Ubuntu's UFW, uh, the uncomplicated firewall, it does actually uh, configure IPv4 and IPv6 in one, so it's sort of a one-hit wonder. Um, so yeah, this is the talk in a nutshell. It's been a, um, quite a lot of information in a little period, which I'm aware of. Um, just a few sort of resources that I used. Now, uh, the IP6, uh, IPv6 Essentials book, there's an Amazon link there. I don't, <laughs> I don't get any uh, contributions here, but it's well worth a look if you're interested in this sort of stuff. Um, I've looked at IPv6 from an um, auditing or a pen testing point of view. There are obviously many attacks on the protocol that, that are known and, and can be a potential um, security as well that may be worth researching. Right, now I'm going to take some questions, um, if there are any, and in the meantime I'm going to hand control over to our next presenter of Anand. So just bear with us a moment. We'll have a, um, a couple of minutes and we'll get the next presentation underway. But like I say, if you've got any questions, please do, uh, please do the, address them in the, in the questions pane. All right, so um, just a quick admin task. If you still have any questions regarding the previous slide, uh, pop in those questions and Owen would be uh, answering those questions as and when they arrive in. Uh, I'll get started with the next uh, presentation that we had in mind here, and uh, that's down by the docker. So the quick idea, what I'm going to cover up in this presentation is basically uh, a high-level overview about docker, and uh, how can you approach docker-based systems from a pen tester's perspective, and then going forward, what are the common attack surface that we see related to docker in the uh, public environment. So a quick introduction about myself. I am Anand Shrivastav. Uh, the handle Anand Shri is uh, my common handle across uh, almost all the social uh, media profiles. Uh, Regional Director for Not So Secure Global Services, approximately nine years of corporate experience, worked with network, mobile application, bunch of different uh, areas, been a speaker and trainer at various conferences, uh, love to work with open source software. So let's get quickly over to the topic that we have at hand. So Docker. Docker is something which is, uh, a lot of people call it the next evolution or the next uh, step towards easy management of systems. In short, uh, earlier days we used to have uh, the VMs where every, uh, the entire operating system will be loaded and then the application would be running. Uh, whereas with Docker, we have the capability where we share the base OS kernel and then on top of it, we have isolated environments dealing with one service at a time. Initially, it was one process per container, but then slowly it was established out to be one service per container. So for example, uh, what you can see here, there's a static binary running on Alpine Linux, which is like the uh, easiest Linux version that you can have, the smallest Linux version that you can have. So uh, that's uh, one. In another container, we have Debian uh, running Java, and on top of it, we have Tomcat server running. Uh, similarly, Ubuntu with .NET and SQL server. So why exactly are we talking about Docker? What, what exactly is trying to uh, do, and why it matters? Point number one, there's a common uh, concern that comes up when, whenever we talk about development environments. It works on my system. And that's, that's a common phrase that you would have seen uh, between discussions when it comes to a developer versus a QA or a developer versus pr a production environment. So it works on my system, does not work on yours, that's your problem. So that's exactly what Docker is trying to solve. Once you have all the system configuration written down in code format and version controlled, you can easily and quickly set up environments, test beds, and that's one of the reasons why startups or POC development teams, they basically love Docker because they can quickly whip up environments, share environments, work with them, and try to get the POCs up and running. Uh, companies like Google, where scalability is a very big matter, they also love it, and they also try to do as much work as possible using Docker. Now, when it comes down to security, uh, just like any other software, Docker is as secure as you configure it. So let's quickly look at what exactly differs 
when you are working with Docker systems. So for, from a pen tester's perspective, uh, if you are looking at a application which is hosted inside Docker environment or if it is running in a VM, you would not know a difference until and unless you get onto the system. But as soon as you get onto the system, that's where the weird uh, stuff starts to kick in. For example, the PID1. PID1 in Unix environment is supposed to be in it or launch D on our system D, but that is not the case with Docker. With Docker, you basically have the actual process that is supposed to be run inside Docker, which could be a shell, which could be, um, say, uh, Nginx or Apache or whatever service you want to run in, that would be PID1. If you look into PROC1 CG group, that's where you see a lot of references of Docker. And that's kind of the indicators that gives you the idea that yes, you're running inside the Docker environment. That brings in the next part. Like I said, the PID1 is not in it, which basically means there might be other things missing, which is exactly the case in terms of Docker. When it comes down to Unix environments, when we attack a Unix environment, we make assumptions. The assumptions are Bash, Python, Perl. These are going to be available all the time, but that's not the case here. They will be available if the container needs it. Otherwise, they might just not be available there. Now, containers are supposed to be disposable in, man in uh, work. So you can create containers at will, destroy containers at will. The services should not be disrupted. But what that effectively means is if you've got access to a container, there's no guarantee of persistence because that system may not be up five minutes from now. Or if you crash a system because of your exploit, you don't know where the next container will spawn in, which host would spawn the next container where you get the access, which effectively means every container that is going to be spawned in may have different resources available to it. So that's one important point that you have to remember. Besides these, another important thing that you need to remember about Docker is uh, there is an internal network that is configured within the Docker system and inter-container communication is possible by default on that particular network, which is 172.17.00 uh, slash 16. The link that I've mentioned gives you more details about this. Uh, the video, and there, there will be a couple of more video links uh, in the slide. These are some of the videos which we basically exposed a couple of months or in past few months. Uh, they basically guide you towards uh, what can happen in various Docker and security scenarios. Like this particular video would basically talk about how can you jump from one Docker container to another and how can you move forward from there. Now, that brings me to the next part, which is Docker roof ups. Now, during the uh, real production environments, we've seen multiple goof ups happening uh, left, right, and center. And some of them is what I wanted to talk about and quickly show you a demonstration of it. Point number one, running container process as root. Now this is one concept that you need to get very, very clear. If you are running a process inside a container as root user, you effectively have the capability to access the base box as root user. Effectively, by default, the host IDs and the container UIDs, they are mapped one to one. So ID zero on a container is ID zero on host. ID 100 on container as ID 100 on host. Now, if you have a file system or part of it is uh, shared, and let's say you have write privileges on that, which is uh, which ID is uh, recommended not to have, but it is something which happens very, very often, you would end up with a system where you get compromises left, right, and center. So let me quickly whip up a screen. And as you can see here, I have a Docker container or Docker host where there are multiple Docker ins uh, instances running, I'm going to simulate an environment where I am running Docker environment as root user and I have mapped the host uh, shares. So as you can see here, slash is mapped to slash host, which effectively means I can actually access every single file of the host system via accessing slash host. So as you can see, I have access to the shadow file, which is the most privileged file when it comes down to Unix environments. So in quick nutshell, do not run container processes as root. That brings me to the next insecurity that I generally see, the Docker socket being exposed or Docker being exposed over TCP network. So access to Docker socket 
double equals to access to Docker daemon. Docker daemon is something which runs with root credentials. When you have a process running as root credentials, you do not give its access to everyone. But this is what I generally see. I see Docker sockets being exposed to everyone. People can connect to Docker sockets, perform actions, or I've even seen Docker uh, being exposed over the network unauthenticatedly. So port 2375 is a default port at which Docker can actually listen, and this is unauthenticated. 2376, where you have TLS uh, certification um, capabilities, and you can do some sort of authentication. Now, why do you actually need some kind similar kind of an access? This is where you have to understand if you are running uh, or if you are creating a system which has dashboarding functionalities or there are functionalities which are dealing with reporting of the application containers or basically messing around with the application containers, that is where you need to expose the Docker socket because that's how Docker daemon can be interacted with. And if there's a misconfiguration or unintended exposure, that leads to host compromise. So let me quickly show you a demonstration of this also. Now here you can see I have got a machine which is exposing the Docker socket which effectively means I can quickly connect to the Docker socket and gain access to various actions. And just like I did here, I can also again go in and run an Alpine container. And like the normal system what we had earlier, I would get access to the uh, shell. Again, slash host is mapped because I had the capability to start any Docker instance I wanted. I don't have shell access on the base box. I don't have shell access inside this box, but at this point, via this method that I have right now done, I have access to all files on the system. Once I have access to all files on the system, it's just a matter of configuring the correct files in correct manner, and I would be in a position to gain shell access on that system. That brings me to the third uh, goof up that I generally see unpatched host, unpatched guests. This is, it, it, it looks like it is uh, something which everyone should understand, but this is something which I found missing in most of the systems. Docker shares the kernel with the host. So even if your Docker host uh, or Docker guest is fully patched, you have the latest version of Docker uh, guest, but if your Docker host is vulnerable to say any recent bugs like say Dirty Cow, you have a scenario where your entire host can be compromised just by having access to the Docker share, Docker uh, guest. Kernel bugs, host compromise. Unpatched guest, guest compromise. The video that I've shown here basically uh, gives you a demonstration of how we got access into one particular Docker uh, host via exploiting the kernel bugs. And I'm gonna quickly show you a similar demonstration. So what you can see here is I've got a listener running on 9999 port. Here I have a Metaproda shell, and as you can see, croc one cg group. You can see I am running inside a Docker container, ls slash, you can see the content on the uh, machine. Let me move to temp, and you can see I have a dirty cow exploit here. And let me actually give it the path for the remote system. And you can see, immediately I got access as root user. Now the interesting thing here is, I've got access to the root of the base machine, the host. This file was not present on slash when we looked up here, because this was inside the container, this is outside the container, we have got access to the host machine. So what, what is wrong is what we discussed, what we can do to secure it. So first and foremost, securely configure everything. Now within the Docker environment, we are supposed to configure Docker in such a way that it is either only accessible to root user or to the users who are, doc who are part of Docker group. So scrutinize that group. Don't just grant everyone access into Docker group. Then Docker socket, Docker daemon, both of them should only be accessible to root users and Docker group users. No one else should have access to them. Docker, uh, if you are exposing the Docker over TCP, enable it over TLS. Do not just blindly expose it unauthenticatedly. Now Docker containers run processes via limited users. Don't run them as root user. 
once you're done with that, you still have to ensure that your host and guest both are kept up to date. How you can ensure that? You have to scan the Docker configuration file. You have to ensure that your host and guest do a proper update every few hours or every few days. How can you go about scanning the Docker configuration files. So these are a couple of resources that I've been looking at. Uh, the Docker security scanning service is available via Docker Hub. There is Clear Project, Atomic Scan, Anchor, uh, Docker Scan, Doc Scan. Uh, any link that you see here which is uh, uh, related to a GitHub uh, project, those are all open source projects. Any other link that I've talked about, they may be uh, specific to those uh, service providers and they may not be available for everyone. The bottom link that I've given is a Nessus uh, profile. So Nessus has come up with an audit profile for your Docker container environments. So you can use that also. Now, while we were actually working on all of this, we thought why not give everyone a glimpse of how Docker vulnerabilities are generally available publicly. So what we did uh, ended up was we created a vulnerable Docker VM. So the URL that you're seeing is where you can download a Docker vulnerable VM. It's available in an OVA format. As soon as you download it, you basically can import it within VirtualBox. Once you boot it, you get these two options that you see on the uh, right hand side. You have a challenge hard and challenge easy. Now, depending on your skill sets, you may require uh, knowledge about Docker, you may require, require knowledge about pen testing, and the combination of both of them would end up giving you access to the host machine. So, if you want to download, just go to the URL. That's where you have the download links and the details about the Docker VM, and you can get started from there. That brings me to the end of my presentation, and this is the point where I would be looking at questions and would be answering some of them, uh, or rather, actually, I'll try to answer all of them. If uh, there's something uh, kind of common for all, I'll try to answer it over uh, the system here. Before doing that, let me hand over the control to the next presenter, which is Will, so that he can get started with this setup. Okay, thank you very much, Anant. Um, as Anant said, please use this time to use questions. I'm going to get started, though, uh, just so we don't fall behind uh, too much on time. So I'm going to be talking about uh, custom rules and broken tools. Quick bit about me. I'm Will. I'm an associate director at Not So Secure. Uh, been in InfoSec for a number of years. Um, do a lot of pen testing currently. Uh, spent several years prior to that in digital forensics and have trained both for a few years now. Anyone who wants to grab me can find me at Stealthploit on Twitter. So what's the plan? Uh, I'm going to com combine uh, two short talks into this short talk. <laughs> the first one is going to be on custom rule efficiency using Hashcat for password cracking. And the second part is going to be on cracking length limitations. So let's move swiftly on to the first part. Quick dipping our toes in the water here for anyone who doesn't do password cracking in terms of uh, the dictionary and the rule attack, so the 101. A dictionary was used commonly when we attack password hashes, and a dictionary may look like something like this on the screen. Of course, dictionaries will contain many, many more words than this, but it gives you an idea. The idea, of course, is to see if any of these password candidates, as they're referred to, are valid when cracking our password hashes to derive the derivative clear text. We can also, though, apply what are called rules to these passwords, and as you can quickly see, this will massively, substantially um, increase the number of possible password candidates we have. So, the examples we have here, the, the clear text dictionary word we want to test is password, but running a number of rules across it will allow us to, to mangle that word as it's referred to, getting lots of different combinations, doing common things that we, we as users tend to do, like character to, uh, sorry, letters to number substitutions and, and symbol substitutions and things like that. Hashcat comes with a lot of rules built in, which is shown on the left-hand portion of this screen. So as you can see, there are a number of uh, rules there named very differently. Uh, some of them are quite small, some of them are very, very big, as you can see by the file sizes. And inside each of those rules, you will see something like the middle picture shown on the screen. So in the example displayed here, we have the RockU30000 rule. And Yes, it looks a bit like gibberish, which is why I've included from the Hashcat wiki the section on the right. So the colon rule, for example, in this case, is kind of like a non-rule. This means do nothing. Just test your dictionary word as is. If you were to see the letter L, it would be lowercase all letters, so on and so forth. In the context of our ROCU dictionary rule here, 
we can see going down there's lots of dollar symbols, which in this case can mean a pen. So the on line number five, the dollar one, two, three, would mean test the word password and then try password one, two, three. And you can quickly see how we don't need to write every possible combination of our, of our password candidates. We can write some very good rules that will allow Hashcat to do the hard work for us. So what did I set out to do? And I wanted to try and create a more efficient rule because uh, you know it's it's a best effort type of exercise, and there's you know there's nothing really out there that can catch it all. So I wanted to try and increase my my average success rate over my password cracking sessions as time went on. How did I do this? Well, I wanted to test Hashcat's existing inbuilt rules and a couple of ones that uh, aren't inbuilt, ones that I've sourced from online test them against a very, very large data set, look at the top performing rules and see if I can combine these to make one unifying rule. What was my test bed? Uh, it was actually the uh, lifeboat breach data, so the computer game Minecraft, uh, the lifeboat community was breached um, in early 2016. Uh, which resulted in the compromise of a number of accounts. These, uh, these data breaches form very, very good password research for security, um, for security researchers like myself. In this particular case, we had 7 million unsorted MD5s as part of that breach, which when deduplicated came down to 4.3 million unique hashes, so a very, very large number of hashes. Unsorted MD5, so very, very cryptographically weak, which provided a very good test bed for me to test, uh, test my system against it. The outcome is, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe not, one rule to rule them all. A, a bit of a, a shout out to any Lord of the Rings fans there with the one ring to rule them all. Then validate my findings to see, which means I'm going to throw my new custom super rule against the lifeboat breach data, and I went on to test it against some other smaller data sets just to see if I was consistently getting better results across the board. And finally, yes, hope I didn't waste my time, because as you can imagine, I was running many, many password cracking sessions over a number of days, so it was quite a, a time-consuming process. So, how did I do each of my tests? This is the command executed in Hashcat. So we call Hashcat. In this case, we need to denote uh, the mode zero, which is the dash M zero parameter, zero being MD5. You would need to look down the, the Hashcat help files to get a, a definitive list of all the modes and their corresponding algorithms. I then passed it a file containing my lifeboat hashes, which I've called lifeboat underscore hashes. Then I passed it the dictionary I wanted to use, which is rockyou.txt. Now, rockyou is a probably the most commonly uh, well-known and used dictionary uh, by penetration testers, security researchers alike. It contains about 14 and a half million words, which, which believe me is actually a very, very small number. But again, coming back to our rules, we can see how those 14 and a half million words can be extrapolated out into, well, massive, massive numbers depending on the quality and the amount of our rules. Status and status timer are just aesthetics for Hashcat, so that will enable Hashcat to give me automatic five second updates on the screen showing me things like progression, speed of cracking, how many I've cracked, so on and so forth. The dash W3 relates to the bottom right hand picture on this screen the workload profile. So by default, Hashcat is run and your system is, is fairly stable. Um, I didn't want to do too much uh, work on my laptop at the time. I wanted to give as many resources to Hashcat as possible. So by assigning the workload profile three, as you can see, it's higher power consumption. The desktop becomes slightly more unresponsive. So it's for, for hard sort of dedicated sessions, really. The two debug uh, parameters here, debug mode and file. Debug mode one relates to the picture on the bottom left. Uh, this allows me to effectively tell Hashcat, when you crack a password using a rule, make a note of the rule. This is so I could do some statistical analysis of it later. So I set the mode to one and outputted that file to a file called Stats Life Post Best 64, as you can see. Pot file disable. Now, this is a very, very important one when testing passwords. By default, when Hashcat cracks a password, it will store the hash and the derivative clear text in a file called hashcat.pot file. If you then go on to use Hashcat again for another password cracking session, Hashcat, the first thing it will do is it will look inside the pot file to see if any of the things you're trying to crack are already present, and if so, it'll skip it. So by doing dash dash pot file disabled, this is effectively me telling Hashcat, treat each password cracking session as a new session so my numbers don't get skewed. I'm going to output my final results with the dash O parameter, and last and almost most importantly, we need to actually assign our rule. So in this case, the best 64 rule. Each time I ran a test, I effectively replaced the three highlighted areas with the name of the rule so that, of course, I didn't lose track and I could keep all of my statistics separate. What were the stats? Now, this is, of course, just a very tiny excerpt, both in terms of the, the number of rules I'm showing you and the length of the spreadsheet, because I can tell you it's absolutely huge. 
we're looking here at the, the, the top few performing uh, rules for you, the Unix Ninja Leap Speak rule and the Dead Hobo rule. So just a couple of things to note here, as you can see, the colon in the Dead Hobo rule, that is don't apply any mangling, so 377,846 rock you dictionary words were enough. Going a couple down, you can see that for just under 42,000 in the Dead Hobo cracked with adding a 123 at the end. Again, the study of passwords is the study of the human mind and how we construct passwords. So we're going to have these rules that are based on very, very common additions and substitutions. Similarly, on the left-hand side, um, I'm not going to jump back to the, the Hashcat wiki, shall we say, but the S is the substitution. So that's substituting A for 4, B for 6, so on and so forth. And as you can see, we can expand these out to get many, many substitutions. And you can just see the types of numbers that are cracking here. Again, we were attacking a, a large data set, 4.3 million unique hashes. So we expected the numbers to be quite big. So what was the success and efficiency of this overall? As you can see, Dive came out on top uh, with over one, just under one, one and a half trillion candidates, so absolutely huge, cracking about 65%, all the way down to Unix Ninja Elite Speak at the bottom. Efficiency, on the other on the other hand, you can see a very very different set of results. Now, this is these are slightly jaded results in the sense that you would expect, let's say, the diver with so many more possible candidates across an average period of time and across a number of average of cracks, you'd expect it to yield more results. However, there are some important things to note here. For example. We can see uh, with the inside pro hash manager uh, rule in comparison to the, let's say the Unix Ninja Leap Speak rule, we can see that uh, on the left hand side the password pro has about 47, just under 45 uh, billion possible candidates and the Unix Ninja Leap Speak within a, within a billion yet in terms of efficiency the password uh, passwords pro was cracking um, one on average every 21,000 guesses compared to about 70,000, just, just under 71,000 for the Unix and Elite Speak. So it was, on average, it was going 55,000 times less before each crack. So again, a good, good to illustrate efficiency there. What about the anomalies? This is a screen showing uh, my, a part of my validation. So after I ran all my tests, I ran them all a second time to be sure. And the highlighted test one and test two is just to denote these are two separate tests, but they were both using the best 64 rule set. As you can see on the left, those numbers are different across the board. Now I found consistently they were all sort of within about 20 of each other. And again, in between individual password cracking sessions, they were consistently different as well. But in particular with the colon, the first question that springs to mind would be, well, hang on, if these are plain passwords, hits throughout the Rock U dictionary, why is it hitting different numbers on the same set of, in the same set of hashes with the same rule? And the answer comes down to anomalies. The, well, the answer comes down to high concurrency being the anomaly, sorry, I should say. Because our, our graphics cards, our hardware, is so, so quick at what it does, high concurrency and multi-threading basically allow Hashcat to occasionally produce different rules, sorry, um, work on different rules to produce the same plain text in different orders. So to give a good example, so if the password was let me in with a capital one and the dictionary contained let me in with a lowercase l, it might happen that Hashcat, one of the threads that Hashcat's running on the, because of high concurrency, the T0 rule, T0 being toggled the, uh, the case of the first position, the position zero, so it's the first character, it might be that T0 on let me in with a lowercase l hit before a thread got in with the, the uppercase, if you see what I mean. So you can, it effectively steals the points. And because this is going at such a speed, these inconsistencies were noted throughout and were found to be consistent. So this is down to our hardware. So what's the super rule creation? I wanted to identify the top quarter performing rules from each rule set, concatenate these together because you could, as you can imagine, some of different rule sets will actually have the same individual rules inside them, deduplicate them and then repeat our tests. What did we have? Well, one rule to rule them all did come out on top, so fortunately I didn't waste my time. <laughs> As you can see, in terms of success rate, uh, we got a 2.72% increase, which doesn't sound like a lot, but does actually equate to just over 117,000 additional cracked passwords. However, it was not the most efficient. On the right-hand side, we're looking at the, basically the bottom half of that. So it wasn't the most efficient, but then again, you do have this, this time trade-off. Again, though, it was not as expensive, shall we say, in terms of time as the dive rule, which as you can see had uh, just under 1.5 uh, trillion. Or well, the NSA one, for example, which I might hasten to add is no affiliation with the NSA, uh, or the CoreLogic one, which are both non-standard, uh, non-default hashcat rules. These are a couple of the ones that I sourced online. Carrying out just some more validation against some smaller data sets, but again, both real life data, so 2.2 million and uh, 423,000 uh, hashes there, respectively, on against SHA-1 and MD5 data. Again, comparing to second place dive, one rule to rule them all did come out top, showing slightly uh, smaller averages, but again, needless to say, 
Uh, still very important because without this rule that I'd created, I would not have seen those cracked passwords. So do we have one rule to rule them all? Unfortunately, no, we don't. There will never be one rule to rule them all because if there was actually one unifying rule, there, no other rules would exist, of course, would have complete coverage. It's always a battle of attrition. It's always a best effort exercise. There are many, many factors to consider. So, of course, we have our available time, the hardware you have, the money to throw at your hardware, and the quality of your dictionary. We used a very, very common dictionary here, and I picked that for a very, very deliberate reason. If your dictionary contained 200 billion words from the start and then you ran the same test, you'd, of course, get different results, but also, <laughs> You'd probably be cracking for a lot, lot longer than I was. The Rock is a very quick and speedy dictionary. It's only 14 and a half million words. It's a continual process, and people tend to do these custom rules and add to them over time as they see better averages. And that's the whole idea about this. It's about increase, increased cumulative average success across the board. They're not supposed to be perfect. They're just supposed to be better than not using them. And I'm going to use this rule going forward in order to try and yield better results. You can read all about this on a blog post that I wrote, the link of which is at the bottom of the screen now, one rule to rule them all. And the rule itself is available on the company's GitHub if you'd like to download and, of course, play around with it yourself to see what kind of results you get. Okay, let's move swiftly on to cracking length limitations. So, the inspiration. Uh, there's a, a guy out there called Rob Fuller who goes by Movix um, on Twitter. He's a very, very clever guy, and he wrote a blog post a couple of months back that, that sparked some interest in me. And this was uh, to resurface the largely unknown fact that because password candidates, when generating them, are stored in your GPU or graphics card registers, there are not actually enough registers to store long candidates for certain password algorithms, and these do differ. So it's a hardware limitation. This basically means that if you have the hash value of a password and you have that password in your dictionary, plain or otherwise, your password tool won't even crack it. So really, really serious because you could literally be trying to crack passwords that you have in your dictionary but you're not aware. There is the potential to exceed these limits but you take a massive performance hit. So it's not really ideal to do. We're going to just touch on this a bit later on. I looked at John the Ripper and Hashcap, because again, these are probably arguably the most two commonly used password cracking tools, with the ultimate idea of getting a cheat sheet, a quick and easy reference guide for people. So back in 2013, uh, OCL Hashcat um, increased support for password length, and generally it went from 15 to 55, and 55 was a bit of a magic number. There were, however, though, some exceptions, and those are shown on the screen now. There is one additional exception, which is Windows, uh, which I'm going to cover separately because that's the one that as pen testers we sort of cover more often than not. So Windows passwords are based on the NTLM hashing algorithm. Now NTLM is based on a UTF-16 little endian. Now UTF-16 uses 16 bits or two bytes per character, which means each character of our password is actually twice the length in bytes. So our magic number of 55, as Hashcat sort of uh, said to us before, is actually divided by two to give us the highest possible integer of 27. This gives us a finite limit for Windows passwords of 27. What I'm obviously saying is that if your password's 28 characters, it's not gonna crack. So of course, me and utter disbelief needed to put this to the test. So I did, and on the screen here you can see I'm running Hashcat two times um, in each of these instances and in uh, future John the Ripper ones that I'm going to demonstrate, the, um, the dictionary file, which in this case I've called Word, only contains the correct password because of course I wanted this to be quick and easy. So as you can see, my first 27 character password of, this is 27 characters, cracked successfully, but changing the password and updating my dictionary, it didn't crack. Now I appreciate 28 letters is probably more than the average you're going to get at the moment, but with recent NIST guidelines, and the way password uh, mentality and ethos is shifting forwards, the, the push on memorable past phrases is supposed to be coming more into play, and, it, and hopefully it will. So 28 characters is going to be on us sooner than you think. SHA-512 crypt, a, a good one to demo here again. That's a very common one found in Linux machines. So again, we have a, a limit here of 16, though, this time. And you can see on the first cracking attempt, we have a weak space SHA-512 crypt that successfully cracks. Adding an exclamation mark to that and updating my dictionary, it does not crack. So 17 characters becoming really into the realms of, of current possibility now. So <laughs> hopefully a few people are going to uh, run back and add an extra character to their Linux passwords. <laughs> Okay, in John the Ripper. John the Ripper is quite nice. It kind of tells us some of this information in advance. And by passing the dash dash list, format all details, we can get an idea. So in the, in the mainline version of John, we can see the maximum password length in bytes of 81. John, by default, accepts input as UTF-8. And I want people to draw attention to the, to the note here. The maximum length is in bytes. 
27 Unicode characters may need up to 81 bytes of UTF in terms of John input, up to 3 bytes per character. So again, let's go back to school. 81 over 3 brings us back to our magic 27 number. So for Windows hashes, for NT, 27 is our magic number. Now, with the 55, again, this magic number that we're going to see, see in a minute, we can actually, and unfortunately, further reduce this for characters that actually use up all three of these bytes. So for algorithm limit, for algorithms... Um, when, when, when cracking algorithms uh, for Japanese passwords, for example, or Chinese passwords, or, or Asian, Asian character sets, these uh, typically use all of the available bytes, and they reduce even further. And that can be seen here. John Jumbo, which is a very specific branch, has been updated to make this easier for us. And as you can see, the two, two boxes I've highlighted here are for Windows hashes and for uh, raw MD5 hashes. So for Windows, we have a flat password length, bear in mind no longer bytes, of 27. And for MD5, we have, uh, rather helpfully, a 50 55 maximum character limit for ASCII, or a worst case UTF-8. So for example, with these Asian character sets, it might be that we actually have a much, much lower limit, depending. Did this in MD5, just as a proof of concept again. Looking at our word list, so catting out my word list shows my password. This, the, the first highlighted box just confirms my password is 55 characters in length. I then try to crack it using John the Ripper, and John cracks it successfully at the bottom. If I add um, a add um, um, a character to that to make it 56 characters however as shown 56 I run rerun it and John can't crack it so again we're hitting higher limits now but again it's very very important to know the limitations of our tools and what that means for us so John can be uh, custom compiled and there's information about that on the link um, non simmed builds can get higher numbers however there is going to be a massive massive performance hit for this unfortunately as a result and it's almost to the point where it's actually probably not worthwhile doing and most people will go against it because many times of course we're attacking passwords and it's a very time boxed exercise you don't want to have to wait around forever not only that for some of the bigger algorithms like let's say SHA-384 that has a maximum limit of 111 how many 112 character passwords are you realistically going to see these days at the moment Hashcat does have a modified version but it unfortunately doesn't support Windows passwords as of yet so it's something to look out for and finally, the cheat sheet, as I said, everything needs a cheat sheet. So this is for John the Ripper, please bear that in mind, Hashcat may differ. This can also be found on our website, uh, this associated blog post, and it will give you a quick and quick and a dirty look. If you have an algorithm, you can have a look up if you're using John to see what your maximum length is. Okay, that is, uh, that's it. We've got a, um, probably a bit of time now to answer some questions, or indeed any outstanding questions from earlier. Um, Owen and Anne and myself will do our best to answer, it, answer them. Um, but that aside, thank you very, very much indeed for joining us today. Um, as I mentioned at the start, um, the slides and a video will be made available online. Um, please contact us using the uh, email addresses on the screen for any pen testing training requirements you may have, or of course anything else. And uh, finally, most importantly, I hope you enjoyed the talk. So thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, yeah, take care. Thank you. Yes, thanks very much, guys. Um, for those of you that wish to stick around, please do so. We've got some questions left. Um, we've, we've answered quite a few. We've got a, question, a few questions left here for, for Will to go through in regards to his last presentation. We appreciate your time, and if you'd like any um, information from us, there's a couple of email addresses there in regards to any um, pen testing training or um, if you want to talk about this webinar, so please do contact us. So over to you, Will. Um, there are a uh, a few questions. If you if you um, are set up and wanted to to take one, we can probably do this verbally now. The presentations have finished. Yeah, um, there are quite a few. You'll have to sorry bear with me, folks. Um, I need to read through them. There are a couple that um, I can probably answer a little bit quicker. So, um, first question I've got here is um, in terms of. Sorry, when, when deciding which rules to use, how do I do it? Um, generally, bigger rules should always be better. Um, yeah, um, quite often they are better, but because very, very large rule sets do take so much longer to complete, um, I often physically don't have the time to do it. I might only have a, a couple of days or maybe a week in which to try and crack hashes to then um, continue on with the assessment. Um, what I tend to do, though, is for very, very fast and cryptographically weak hashing algorithms like NTLM or MD5, I tend to throw much bigger rule sets um, against them because the speed you'll crack at uh, will likely exhaust the larger rule set quicker. But for very, very cryptographically complex hashes like a Blowfish, for example, I will tend to throw smaller and more efficient rule sets, like maybe a couple from the, the slide earlier on efficiency, that are of course relative to the size, uh, against it first, just to see if there's any low-hanging fruit that catches, because of course, once the cryptographic strength increases, uh, the, the, the speed really, really decreases. Uh, to give you an idea about speed, I, I 
if I'm cracking on my laptop, my laptop has a, a mobile GTX 1060 graphics card and it cracks Windows passwords at around about 10 to 11 billion a second. Now, whilst that's very, very quick and it just goes to show you what can be done on the mobile, this brings me back to the, the best case, you know, of people who want to buy um, dedicated password cracking rigs and throw some desktop graphics cards at it, you can very, very quickly get to it in absolutely massive, massive numbers. Uh, when you bring on a stronger algorithm, then of course the speed really, really drops. So there's no one rule I pick, but of course the biased answer is now, I'm always going to use one rule to rule them all. <laughs> um, there's another one I've got here. Um, and what um, mentioned on the slide, non-SIMMED build. Um, yeah, okay, um, SIMMED stands for um, string, Single Instruction Multiple Data. It effectively means that um, you can allow simultaneous or parallel computations, but only a single process at any given moment, so there's no concurrency. Um, Non-SIMMED builds do allow for multiple instructions, so they have concurrency, but as a result, performance is absolutely drastically reduced. So this is, comes back to the whole, the performance hit almost isn't worth it, uh, especially for some of the password lengths that we're probably not re you know, realistically reaching um, nowadays. Um, I have another one here. Um, is it possible to see, uh, can we make Hashcat see all of the, all of the guesses it makes? Um, yes, yes you can. Um, okay, I can probably actually do a quick um, a quick demo for that on the screen. If I go into my hashcat folder, um, I think the question is asking, can we just see all of our password attempts? Um, what that yeah, I suppose you could do that, and you could make your own custom dictionary from it if you wanted to. Um, if I um, echo the word test, let's say, into a file called test dictionary dot text, um, and then you can run hashcat against this. Um, if I just use test dictionary dot text. You need to, of course, give it a rule. So let's use my one rule to rule them all. Uh, and, and what you need to do in Hashcat is to append the standard out. So just add again dash dash std out. If you hit that, you can quickly see it is spamming down my screen um, permutations of test. And of course, a lot of this look, Lamborghini test is in there. You can see that this one rule to rule them all does have a lot. And what I'll quickly do is just to show you, I'll append. Uh, pipe more to that just to be easier to see. So as you can see, it takes the takes the word test and it will run through. And of course, some of these yes may derive actually the same word. Um, it's not uncommon. But as you can see, this will be all the possible uh, the possible guesses. You're not doing anything else here apart from print this to a screen. But then of course you could take this and take that out to a file if you want to to actually see what you're doing. Um, it, it's also very very useful to do. If you if you actually know the clear text password of your hash and you're testing your rules, if you if you've cleverly inserted your clear text password into your dictionary and you want to see if your rules are generating the right derivative clear text, uh, then of course it's a good way to test to make sure your your rules are actually working as planned. Okay. Um. With that said, we have gone a little well, five minutes over the allocated time, and there are a number of questions we haven't been able to um, answer in the time period. The contact at Not So Secure email address you see on Will's slide at the moment, feel free if we haven't managed to answer your questions to ping them to that address. Um, the slides and the recording will be available um, most likely tomorrow morning at this rate because it does take a little bit of time to render. But we hope you've enjoyed it and um, please, uh, please contact us with any further inquiries. Thanks very much for your time everyone. Thank you very much everyone. Take care.